Well, praise the Lord. Let's just get right to it this morning. This is the promises of God in Christ, part eight. We're going to be talking about bodily healing and Paul's thorn in the flesh. Before I even get started, I just want, as way of reminder, we need to remember that faith cometh by hearing the word of God. So that seed, that word is planted, and we have to cultivate that seed and protect that seed so that that seed can grow. But too often, people are allowing that seed to be planted and then constantly checking on it, opening it up and digging up the ground and checking to see that it's still in there. No farmer plants the seed and then unplants it. That defeats the purpose of the seed. The seed has to be planted and it has to stay in the good ground. Last Wednesday, Steve had reminded me of a very simple but powerful principle within the scriptures. Jesus, in talking to his disciples, asked them when talking about the parable of the sowers, did they not understand it? Because to not understand it, they, he said that the key to understanding all the parables was unlocking this parable. That we know that when the sower sows, Jesus, the, the word of God goes forth and that seed falls on different, different types of ground. What I want to remind you of this morning as we go through a series, as we're talking about the promises of God in Christ, and specifically in these last few parts, we're talking about bodily healing being a part of the promises of God towards us in Jesus. That make no mistake that when you receive this word, the enemy, like the birds of the air in the parable that Jesus told, will come and try to snatch it out. The question is, was the word planted in good ground where the birds wouldn't be able to devour it? Or are they going to come and snatch it up from you? Because that's exactly what the enemy seeks to do, is to cause doubt in the word of God. So again, just getting to it, our core text has been 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. And it's important as we go this, I want you to keep in your mind that this is Paul writing this. This is the same Paul that we're going to address this morning when it comes to what his thorn in the flesh was. And the reason this is important because his thorn in the flesh has been used so many times by so many people to cast doubt on the word of God towards God's children about bodily healing for themselves. But Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, he says this, For all the promises of God in him, that is, in Jesus, are yea and in him amen, unto the glory of God by us. Now, I don't know about you, but I think most of us like guarantees. Anyone that I've known that has put their hope in the doctors and they go to the doctor, they hope that what the doctor is giving them is going to help them. They hope that, that it'll fix everything. But for those of us that maybe haven't had as serious of health implications or health issues, I think most of us at maybe some point have dealt with maybe scalpy head. I don't know about you, but I have, where you didn't want to wear a black shirt or jacket because just the rubbing of your head caused flakes to fall everywhere. Anyone ever experienced that before? Maybe you men, if you've ever chose to grow a beard out, you probably have definitely experienced it because that beard gets really extra flaky and I can't even run my fingers through my beard like this and I look at my chest and there's just flakes falling everywhere. Well, one product that most of you are probably aware of is head and shoulders, which helps with flakes. Why do I mention that this morning? Now, I, I just want to say very quickly, in case anyone from head and shoulders is listening to this, I do think this is a good product. <laughs> uh, it has benefited me greatly at many different times, but I do think it's, it's funny, and I'm only using this illustration because it was readily at hand. It was sitting in our tub this week, and I noticed it, and I was, began to read the label on it, and you probably can't see this at home, but right here, this, this little stamp, it says 100% flake-free guarantee. Isn't that what we want? We, don't know that we want to know that when we use something, it's going to work. 100% flake-free guarantee. Well, fantastic. I use this product, my flakes are gone. The problem is, is in smaller print, you know, that, that fine print, those little details, all those commercials you see that, oh, this is great. And then at the end, the little, all the words scroll by that tell you what, you know, you don't really want to hear that diminish their guarantees. Flake free guarantee up to 100%. Well, now if I'm wanting to put my confidence in something, my confidence was just shot because up to 
100% means it could be anywhere from 0% to 100%. Anywhere between that spectrum. This may not help you at all. As we talk about the promises of God in Christ, the question that comes to mind is, can we put our hope in what he's saying? Can we count it as true? Is it a guarantee? Or is it up to and maybe including, but possibly not? You have been called to preach and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the question is, is this gospel of God too good to be true? Is the salvation of the whole man through Christ's atonement too good to be true? I want to read you a couple of passages just as way of introduction. Just listen to this. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9-12, through 12, and it says this, But as it is written... I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of the man which is in him? Meaning, if I look at Tim, what do I really know about Tim, what's going on in his mind, except... Tim. Tim knows what's going on inside Tim's mind. I may not, but Tim does. And that's what he's saying here. Yea, the deep things of God. For, again, for, verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God knows. Verse 12. Now, this is important. Now, we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. God has given us His Spirit so that we can know what things are ours in Christ. He's not trying to hide them from us. And again, in Romans 12, and you're all familiar with this passage, I hope, Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech you, Paul is begging the Romans that he's writing to, I'm begging you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's reasonable that you would give your whole body unto God in service to Him. Verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now we know there are lots and lots of very educated people who have studied this word, but that have never come to the revelation of who the Christ is, because this is revealed of God by His Spirit. And if you are His and you've been born again, He says, I want to make known to you the goodness of God in Christ and those things which pertain to that. He says, I want you to look into this word and with the help of the Holy Spirit, prove what the good will of God is. If we don't know the will of God, we don't have anything to stand on. But God has demonstrated His will towards the world in Christ unto salvation. Now we have said in the last few parts of this series that Jesus did not only come to forgive men of his sins, but to save them from the oppression and the works of the enemy. Part of that being the destruction of these bodies through sickness and disease. But because of doubt, many have not obtained the health that we are purporting to be theirs in Christ Jesus by his atonement. And they base it on this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 and 9. And I'll give you a moment to turn there. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 and 9, where it speaks of Paul's thorn in the flesh. And here Paul writes this, and we'll, we're going to look at the broader context of this in just a little bit. But it says, And lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing, this, this messenger that was sent to him, this thorn in the flesh, I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient 
for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, says Paul, therefore will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now the question this morning is, was Paul's thorn in the flesh some type of sickness or disease? That's the question. Many claim that it was, and that this is ground to stand on with Paul for their own lack of healing. I want to offer you four reasons this morning that this position does not make sense. Number one, it doesn't make sense in light of the clear teaching of Scripture on Christ's atonement. This atonement which we looked at briefly, we could have went so much further and looked at so many other passages, but last week we focused in on Matthew chapter 8 and Isaiah 53, where the Holy Spirit interpreted prophecy for us in regard to Jesus healing all those that came to Him. The same grounds that Jesus had for healing the body, He had for healing the soul. And on these grounds were all healed who came to Him. Again, excuse me. Matthew chapter 8, verse 16 and 17. It says, When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirits with his word. And he healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Now, I'm just going to get ahead of myself for a moment, but this is very important. One of the reasons that this doesn't make sense, and I'm going to tie this in later, is it doesn't make sense in context of everything Paul is saying in this passage. Just as, I mean, looking at things in the Scriptures in context is so important. In Matthew chapter 8, if you were unfamiliar with the prophet Isaiah and what he said in Isaiah chapter 53, just by context... Here, we would know what God meant by the word infirmities and its use. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. We can see that in this passage, the word infirmities carries the weight of meaning something wrong with our bodies. Something being sick, because that's what the passage says at the end. Just keep that in your mind as we talk about context later. But again, talking about it being a part in the atonement and why this doesn't make sense because healing is a part of the atonement. Mark chapter 2, verse 1 through 12. Again, a story that most children that were raised in church are familiar with. It's a very popular story. It's the story of the paralyzed man that was let down through the roof by his friends. And the reason that he's let down is because there was so many people crowding Jesus within this home that there was no way for them to get into the house. So they look up, at, because remember the architecture in Jewish homes, often their roofs were flat and they would even use this as a place to entertain and, and enjoy themselves. And so these men climb up to the roof and begin to take apart the roof in order to let their friend down. Let's look at this passage in verse 4, starting in 4b through 12a. It says, They let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why did this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit, that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk. Which is easier? Thy sins be forgiven thee, than to have faith in the person to have faith to receive healing for such a thing. But, and this is interesting, because he, speak, he turns and he's speaking to the man with palsy, but that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Guys, we're not diminishing the importance of Christ's atonement towards the forgiveness of sins when we focus on the healing of the body. We're putting importance on the preeminence in the, of Christ's purchase of our whole person through His suffering. But that you may know the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thy house. And immediately he arose and took up the bed and went forth before them all. So that you may know that I have authority to forgive you, though these men are questioning that. Stand up. 
I ask again this morning, is the good news too good to be true? Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. I've already alluded to this. Number two, it doesn't make sense in context. I'm not going to belabor or spend any longer on atonement this morning. It doesn't make sense in context. Paul's letter here is an appeal to the Corinthians not to wander away from the truth. He fears that if they believe these false teachers that had come in amongst them, they will be deceived and walk away from the truth in Christ. Now, any of the letters you read in Paul, there's always some encouragement and there's always some form of, guys, get this right. But he seems to have had more trouble and, guys, get this right towards the Corinthians than with any other group of believers that he had helped father in the faith. And so there's lots of correction within the letters to the Corinthians. And here he is concerned because these false or super apostles, as he calls them, had come in and the Corinthians were ooing and awing over these men who were not even true followers of Jesus. Now I want you to turn with me, and this is a, a bit of a large section of Scripture. I'm not even reading all of it. This starts in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, but I'm going to begin in chapter 11, where he begins to speak sarcastically even, as he's trying to awaken the Corinthians to their plight if they continue following the teachings of these false teachers. And he is foolishly glorying in some of the things that God has done in his life. And I'm going to start in chapter 11, verse 1. I just want you to see this in context. Okay, here we go. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband. I have given you to one husband that I might present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, he says, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. You're bearing with all these things that we did not bring to you from these other teachers. For I suppose, verse 5, I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles. But though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge. He, he comes across this theme several times where he talks about not being a smooth orator. Though I be rude in speech, a little bit rough around the edges in his, his uh, public speaking, but he's not rough in knowledge. He knew who Jesus was. But we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that you might be exalted because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely? I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. <clears throat> and when I was present with you and wanted, meaning he was without, meaning for food, for clothing, for shelter, I was chargeable to no man. For that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. And in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Wherefore, why? Because I love you not, God knoweth. But what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory they may be found even as we. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, meaning no wonder, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. I say again, let no man think me a fool. If otherwise, yet as a fool receive me, that I may boast myself a little. That which I speak, I speak if not after the Lord, but as if it were foolishly, in this confidence of boasting. Seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will also glory. For you suffer fools gladly, seeing you yourselves are wise. 
For you suffer if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face. I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak, howbeit whereinsoever any is bold, again, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more. In labors more abundant. Who worked more for Christ than Paul? In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequent. In deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes. Say one, can you imagine? Five different occasions where he received thirty-nine stripes. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwrecked. A night and a day have I been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. This is important. All these things that he mentions. Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily. All these things came from without against him, but also the things inside of him that he had to care for, that were burdensome to him, and that because he was concerned about the churches. Verse 28, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily the care of all the churches, who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? He cared about God's children. He carried the weight of their burdens. Verse 30, If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. That word infirmities. The God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. In Damascus, the governor under Aretas, the king kept the city of the uh, Damascenes with a garrison, desirous to apprehend me. And through a window in a basement was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. Now stay with me. I said this, this will be our longest passage reading. Chapter 12, verse 1. It is not expedient for me doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one will I glory. Yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. I realize this is a lot. In the King James, this may be a whole lot for some of you. Go back and read it again. Look at other translations and compare it and just grasp the understanding of all these things he's saying. Verse 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. He'd received all these revelations. And lest he was to be exalted, to be puffed up, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. Lest I should be exalted above measure. This happened 14 years ago where this was given. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in mine infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Again, context is important in this listing of what this looked like. He's giving us a, a list of what this buffeting looked like. Verse 11, I am become a fool in glorying. You have compelled me. For I ought to have been commended for, of you. For in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. Truly, verse 12, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. For what is it wherein you are inferior to other churches, except it be that I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me this wrong. Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you. For I seek not yours, but you. 
For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. And I will very, very gladly spend and be spent for you. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. He loves them, and the more he's loved them and given himself for them, that love is not being reciprocated. I could read on, and I planned on it, but I'm going to stop. I do want to mention this. In verse 13, he reiterates this idea of weakness again, speaking of the fact that having loved them, he, he would gladly be weak for them, meaning to be spent for them. Verse 3, since you seek proof of Christ speaking to me, which to you word is not weak, but is mighty in you, for though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God towards you. Now let's break some of this down. Remember, this is a, uh, he, he's appealing to them expressing his love and how he's laid down his life for the gospel's sake unto them and others. And here everywhere in these chapters, when using the word infirmity, it is speaking of weakness, tiredness, affliction, not sickness. Now to be sure, the word infirmity carries with it the weight of, of sickness. We've already looked at it in, in Matthew chapter 8. And in other places, it definitely means that. But the word itself, as he uses it, made perfect in weakness, glorying in my infirmities. In, in, our, in our select passage of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse um, 7. <clears throat> that, those are the same two words, weakness and infirmities. This is asteneia. It means want of strength, weakness, infirmity. This weakness can be of the body or of the soul. I'm just going to give you a few quick verses of different ways it's used. Again, we've already said Matthew chapter 8, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Again, it can mean sicknesses. Acts chapter 28 verse 9. So when this was done, others also. This is talking of Paul in ministry on the island of Malta. It says those which had diseases in the island, that's the same word, that word diseases, came and were healed. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 3, he says, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and in trembling. He's not talking about being with them in sickness. What was he fearful of? Their salvations. He purposed not to come, he says, using lofty words, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that their faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And again, just another example where it's not being used in regard to sickness. Romans chapter 6, verse 19. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. Talking about not the sickness of your flesh, but the weakness of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, your body, your person, servants to righteousness unto holiness. I wanted to be clear, that word does not always carry the weight of sickness. It can just mean weakness, which Paul was. He's going without food. He's going without sleep. He's going without clothes. It makes one weak. <laughs> the messenger in our passage was sent to buffet him. This means to strike at. The word is only used five times in the New Testament. And I want to show you the five times it's used. Very interesting. Matthew chapter 26, verse 27. Then, then did they spit in his face, speaking of Jesus, and buffeted him. And others smote him with the palms of their hands. Remember, in context, King James has a good way of taking these words that sometimes seem unfamiliar to us. And if we just look at them in context, we can draw out the meaning thereof. They're buffeting him. They're, they're striking him. They're spitting on him. Mark chapter 14, verse 65, again, and some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to buffet him and to say unto him, prophesy, and the servants did strike him with the palms of their hands. A third time, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 11, even unto this present hour, and this is Paul speaking, the same Paul who here is talking about the servants sent to buffet him, that up to this very hour we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. Again, all these lists, and all these lists pointing to this outside buffeting, those things coming against them from the outside. And again, in our passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, where he's talking about it was sent to buffet him. And in chapter, uh, excuse me, and in number 5, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 20, For what glory is it 
if when you are buffeted for your faults, meaning something on the outside coming in, people, you're being buffeted, whether it's by the authorities because you've done something wrong, what, good, what is it to you if you take that patiently? You deserved it. You did wrong. But if when you do well and you suffer for it, it means when you're suffering for the sake of Christ, when you do that and you take it patiently, that is acceptable with God. Let's look again. This is strengthened by Paul's use of the term thorn in the flesh. Remember, Paul is a learned Jewish man, having committed to memory much of the Old Testament scriptures. And so for him to draw forth this illustration is not a surprise. And how was this illustration of a thorn in the flesh used in the Old Covenant? The scriptures teach in Numbers 33, 55, and in Joshua 23, 13, that if the Israelites did not drive out the heathen nations from the promised land, the peoples would become pricks in their eyes and thorns in their sides. That's what it says in Numbers and in the Joshua. It reverses it and says thorns in their sides and pricks in their eyes. And shall vex you in the land wherein you dwell. Now when God told them that through Moses and through Joshua, was he saying that when they, if they didn't drive these heathen out, that these people would become diseases in their body? No. These people would become oppressors and persecutors and irritants in their lives as they were. As Israel in the book of Judges, is, is that's what I'm reading in the year through the Bible right now, over and over, the Israelites stray from God and they, they had not driven these people out and the people would take them into bondage and become irritants to them and taskmasters persecuting them. And then they would cry out to God and he would deliver them. Paul has here listed for us those things that came against him. And in this context, sickness is not amongst it. It is not even mentioned but rather the messenger of Satan was sent to buffet him. If anything that we draw from these passages, from these lists of all the things that Paul endured, it was persecution. It was lack of love from his own brethren who should have been supporting him, but rather they were being abused by these false apostles and not recognizing how much love Paul had demonstrated towards them. This passage needs to stop being used to make shipwreck people's hope and faith in the goodness of God towards them in Christ. Now stay with me. If you're not yet convinced, just, just look at the list. All of this has to do with things that had come without. Things attacking him. Persecution. Number three, it doesn't make sense in the bolstering, meaning the strengthening or the stimulation of others' faith for healing and miracles that were a regular part of Paul's ministry. If Paul is sick in his body or there's some type of disease which many espouse is what this thorn in the flesh was, it would have made it very hard, at least in the way that I see it, for him to have the ministry that he had and for people to look at Paul and think, well, seeing him and the sickness in him, that really encourages me to have faith for healing. Guys, I'm not trying to be funny, but let's look at this. Let's think about this. Suppose Paul is sick, perhaps as many say, with a disease in his eyes. Isn't it strange that when in Lystra, as recorded in Acts 14, there sat a certain man at Lystra that was impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, so he never walked, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak. He's preaching the gospel. Now, if he had just preached the forgiveness of sins, this man would have had no hope for healing. But he's hearing the whole counsel of God, which is what Paul preached. And listen to what it says. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly, Paul steadfastly, beholding him, this crippled man, and perceiving that he had faith to be healed. Paul's preaching this message, and he's looking in the audience, and he sees this crippled man, and he can see by the look on the man's face that the man had faith to be healed. There's hope that is glimmering in this man's eyes. And so with a loud voice, Paul said, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lyconia, The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. Isn't it strange? Isn't it strange that when the Ephesians saw the sickness in his eyes, and the fact that God would not heal him, that they would then have faith for healing and special miracles at the hand of Paul among them. Again, Acts chapter 19, verse 11 and 12. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. 
And these really are special because we don't read anything like them anywhere else. So that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and evil spirits went out of them. I would love it if that I was so full of the Spirit of God and His virtue so flowed in me that just things that I had touched people could take and, and people would think we were practicing witchcraft. It seemed so strange and yet this was a part of the ministry of Paul. That people could take these things that he had touched, take them into the streets where he, wasn't, where he was not even present and touch people with them. And it says that evil spirits were fleeing. Right after this passage, it talks about the seven sons of Sceva who, recognizing this power and authority that Paul walked in because of Christ, that they tried to cast out demons. And the, the demons look at them and say, we know Jesus and we know Paul, but who are you? And it says the, 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 the demon-possessed man <laughs> beat them up and they left bloody and naked. But Paul knew Jesus. Isn't it strange? Isn't it strange that when writing to the Romans, in Romans chapter 15, verse 18 and 19, Paul says this, For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me. I'm not talking about things God has done through other people. I'm talking about things God has done through me. To make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. Through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Elysium I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. He had fully preached it to make the Gentiles, who were formerly estranged, obedient by word and deed, both by what he preached and what he did amongst them. Mighty signs and wonders. Isn't it strange that those things would be happening amongst the people with a man who was plagued by disease and sickness, how they would have faith for these things to happen. Isn't it strange that many years later, after receiving his thorn in the flesh, while on the island of Malta, as recorded in Acts 28, that the chief official's father was ill with fever and a bloody flux. I'm not sure exactly what that is, but it sounds gross. That Paul laid hands on him and healed him, so that when it was done, others also, which had diseases in the island, came and were healed. This is years later in his ministry, and the Spirit is still working in both realms of salvation through Paul. Isn't it strange that seeing his diseased body would have given any of these hope for their own healing? Isn't it strange that it was the Apostle Paul who, wanting to bring clarity to the operations of the Spirit, addressed God giving the church gifts of miracles and gifts of healing? He said that these gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Then telling the Corinthians to covet desire or to desire these best gifts. I realize God has given you these gifts, but he did not really intend for them to be in use. Isn't it strange? Isn't it strange that the Corinthians, this is really important, who we could say again that Paul had the most difficulty with, didn't throw his sickness back in his face, at least not that we read of, when he told them in regard to not rightly discerning the Lord's body when they were taking communion. Remember, when he addresses the, the, the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians about taking communion, he, he's, he's rebuking them. And he says this, because of the way they were taking communion and not rightly esteeming the body of Christ, both meaning his body born again in the flesh, those men and women and children that had been born into his body, not rightly looking into them as being part of the body and they're, they're gluttonizing themselves and even drinking up everything and there's people that are actually sitting there starving and hungry, but also not rightly esteeming what Christ's body through atonement means for his church. And he says this because of this, he says, for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you and many have even died. And he said, and, and right after he says that, he says, but if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Isn't it strange that they didn't ask Paul, well, Paul, then what's going on with you? Why are you sick? Have you not judged yourself? F.F. Bosworth says this, Paul distinctly states that his buffeting by the messenger was given him lest or for fear that he should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations given him. Is it because of the abundance of their revelations that the sick everywhere today must be taught to regard their sickness as a thorn which must remain lest they be exalted? Paul's thorn was no hindrance to his faith for the healing of those in the accounts we just looked at. And we've not looked at all of them. Listen to that again, though. 
But this thorn, if that's what it is, if it's sickness, it was still no hindrance in his life for the manifesting of these gifts to flow out from him to see others healed. Why should his, thin, his thorn then in the flesh be a hindrance to ours? The Bible says faith cometh by hearing. These people had faith for healing and miracles through the hands of Paul because of what Paul preached. But today, people cause faith rather than to, be, to come in to leave by hearing their version of Paul's thorn in the flesh. Paul could declare in his ministry, I have kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. Paul also said, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. The question is, are we fully preaching the gospel of Christ? Number four, it doesn't make sense in light of the word being rightfully divided. And I, 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 give it, I, I say that because this, this, saying it that way, I can encompass several other little things. And I want to address them quickly. And then we'll close. Again, we've already said Paul was a Jew. Paul knew the word and the word was clear. Remember what we talked about two or three parts of this series ago. In the old covenant, under the people of Israel, there was no mistake. It was very clear. You can look at it for yourself. That when they walked with God, health was a part of the blessing. When they were in rebellion to God, sickness and disease were a part of the curse. Period. Paul is the one writing to the Galatians. So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Again, Paul is the one who labored more than any other in Christ, and apparently this sickness or disease did not hinder it. Paul is the one who compels us to stir one another up unto good works. He wrote that we are to be prepared unto every good work, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, and perfect in every good work to do His, Jesus' will. I don't know about y'all, but those that I have witnessed that, whose bodies have been ravaged with sickness or disease have had a really hard time to be full of good works when they're laying in a sick bed. Now, I'm not saying they can't still do some good works. I'm not saying they still can't exhibit patience and glorify God Christ in that. I'm not saying they can't continue to pray for others while laying in their sick bed. But can they really be prepared unto every good work? Can they really be furnished unto all good works? Can they really be perfect in every good work to do His will while laying in a sick bed? Do these commands belong only to healthy Christians? I recently, in the, this year, Katie has really had a bout with her knees. Any of you that know my wife, Katie, know that as a young girl, her and her sister were diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. And over the years, there have been some flare-ups. We believe them to be attacks from the enemy. As we do believe, years ago, God had declared her healed. And we believe that and continue to stand on that. But I want to tell you that when this year it got really bad, and I watched her get out these... Uh, copper knee braces. Some of you may have seen them before and have to put these on her legs and, and stiffly do so and in pain and then put her pants on and you can see the outline of the knee braces under her pants. There were times that this almost debilitated her. Her knee was in so much pain because it, didn't, it doesn't just attack her legs. It attacked her very being, her person. She was diminished. She was um, downcast. She was frustrated because she, it hurt to walk. She would lay in bed. Now, I ask you, as a mother, was she able to do every good work that a mother is called to do while laying in bed? No. And the question is, are we going to agree with it and say, well, as some even told her, you have to remember Paul's thorn in the flesh. So is this my wife's thorn in the flesh that she's not to get up out of this bed? God forbid. An example, Je Peter's mother-in-law during Jesus' ministry was sick and lay in bed with a fever. Could she do every good work while laying in bed with a fever? No. What did Jesus do for her? He healed her. And what did she get up and do? She did a good work unto them. It says that she served them. She, she provided meal unto them. Many have actually died prematurely, not having finished their course which Paul did. Paul finished his course. He ran his race and was prepared. 
for the time of his departure. But many have not been able to do that because they died from what had been taught was their thorn in the flesh as they laid in their sick beds. Many have leaped from Paul's thorn in the flesh mentioned in our passage this morning to making a connection all the way over in Galatians where Paul does not where Paul does mention a physical infirmity. Let's look at that because some of you may already have had that in your mind. Well, what about Galatians where he says, well, let's look at that. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 13 and 15, he says, You know how through the infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. And my temptation was in my flesh. Oh, excuse me. And my temptation which was in my flesh you despised not nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness you spake of? For I bear record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Now this, this passage does seem to reference some sort of something, sickness or weakness in his flesh that had happened to him. And it seems to point towards his eyes. And that's why I, in some of these other points we make, we mention his eyes because that, a lot of people that reference him having a sickness or disease mention some type of oriental disease that they believe he had in his eyes. And a lot of that is based on this passage in Galatians. But I want you to remember something here. Remember the book of Acts covers around 30 years in time. Paul's thorn in the flesh was given 14 years prior to his letter to the Corinthians. Somewhere around 42 AD. It is suspected by many and seems based on the writings available to us that Paul's first missionary journey began around 48 AD, during which time it is recorded in Acts chapter 14, verse 19 and 20. It says, it was, this is what was recorded. And there came that there certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul, remember in Corinthians, he said stoned once. And having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, meaning they dragged him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Howbeit, as the disciples stood around about him, you know, they're looking at him, weeping, I'm sure. He rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. Interestingly, Derby is in Galatia. So on his first missionary journey, he's in Lystra. He heals the man who's crippled in his feet. All these mighty works. The people want to exalt him and Barnabas as gods. Yet they obviously refute that and say, no, we are men just like you. It is through the power of Jesus Christ and what he's done that this man has been healed. And yet despite this good work under these people, there are still people in the midst of Lystra that stir up distrust and they actually get together and they stone Paul nigh unto death. They assume him dead. And why would they have assumed him dead? Because when you stone someone, you stone them to death. Now, whether he really died or not, I don't know. I think he probably did, and God resurrected him, rose him right up, and he went right back to work. And he went right into the southern parts of Galatia. So, and now, guys, I realize there's some surmising here, because I, 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 I can't guarantee that this is how it happened. But if he's preaching the gospel in Galatia, that passage we just read is as at the first. Meaning, when I first came to you, you did not despise the way that I looked and what was going on with my body. Now, I don't know about you, but you're being stoned. I think we'd all be trying to cover up our face because it's such a sensitive spot and, and you're being hit. But at some point, the stones begin to win the battle and your hands drop. Now, I can only imagine what his face looked like what his eyes look like. But might not this be more in line with what we see everywhere else in the scriptures and the fact that the Galatians in receiving him after this stop in Lystra where he was stoned have to do with having been stoned than it does with some disease that the rest of the scriptures don't support? And, that, and, and again, what's interesting too, just let me not, let me not fail to emphasize this, as I preached unto you at the first, meaning that whatever this was had an end. It didn't last. Again, we have already looked at many of Paul's hardships. And y'all, stay with me, we're almost done. Paul is attacked from without. 
Christ's atonement promises salvation of the whole man, but it does not promise freedom from persecution and tribulation, but actually promises to see you through it. Paul, like the scriptures everywhere else, differentiates between miracles and healing. Paul did not believe in every person being instantly made whole because we see he left Trimophius at Miletum sick. We see Ephroditus was sick even nigh unto death. He was close to death. Why? For the gospel's sake, meaning he was overworked. Anybody ever worked to the end and given themselves that their body was so run down that it couldn't fight off sickness? And from such, he did not recover instantaneously. I want you to think for a moment about Christ telling the parents of the little girl after he healed her to give her something to eat for strength. Though Christ had made her whole, her body still needed something, and these people needed to continue to rest to recover. Paul was not aware, excuse me, Paul was quite aware of the natural laws of health which God has set in place. He did not hesitate to recommend the fruit of the vine in the place of water alone for Timothy's stomach trouble. Paul believed in the sick themselves having faith for healing. He told the cripple again at Lystra to stand up on his feet only after perceiving that the man had faith to be healed. Jesus himself could not do miracles in his hometown because of their unbelief. So in closing, I want to say this. In Christ's words, my grace is sufficient. Mean that he is telling Paul, is it, does it mean that he is telling Paul to remain sick? It would be the first and only recorded instance in the Bible in which God ever told anyone to keep his disease. If it is true that Paul's thorn in the flesh was a disease, why has this become the rule in our teaching rather than the exception? Why do so many seem to have a thorn in their flesh that keeps them from healing? It doesn't make sense. And I close with an instructive resume by F.F. F. Bosworth with my own emphasis added. Is it not strange how any minister can set aside the whole Bible as far as the subject of healing is concerned while keeping in the background? I want to read that part again so you're with me and you know what I'm talking about. This is an instructive resume. This is the resume of the Bible, what the Bible has given us. And, and the question is asked, is it not strange how any minister, how any Christian, can set aside the whole Bible as far as the subject of healing is concerned while keeping in the background these truths. God's redemptive and covenant name, Jehovah Rapha, which means the Lord thy healer. God's covenant with the Israelites of healing. The teaching and promises of healing in the Old Testament types. The universal president of healing set throughout the history of the Old Testament. The words, teaching, commands, promises, and healing ministry of Christ by which he revealed the will of God for our bodies, the gifts of healing set in the church, the church ordinance of anointing, which is commanded in James, is any sick among you, let him call for the elders and anoint him with oil. And if he's committed any sins, he shall recover. The fact that Christ bore our sickness as well as our sins on Calvary the multiplied thousands of those healed since the days of the apostles down to and including our days in particular. Is it not strange that they can set aside all of this and when speaking on the subject of healing, choose as their text their, the scripture concerning Paul's thorn, which scholars admit they cannot prove has any reference to either sickness or healing. Isn't it strange? It doesn't make sense. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just bless you in this place, Lord. I just pray that your word would go forth in power and authority, Lord, and would renew the minds of your people, Lord. Renew my mind this morning. And let us walk in this truth. Let us exercise this truth. Let us preach this truth. Let us claim this truth for ourselves, Lord. If there are any of your children, Father, who are now at home and sick, or disease in their body, Lord. We speak health and healing, Father. I pray that you would raise up your servants, Lord. I pray that your spirit would manifest itself in miracles and healings and in faith and words of knowledge and wisdom, Lord. We pray for your children, Lord, that your body might be edified by your goodness unto us in the atonement of Christ and what you've redeemed and purchased on our behalf, Father. 
We bless you in this place. I pray against doubt, Lord, that seeks to undo your good work. I bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would, uh, Craig.